That's Luke chapter 20, verses 19 through 26. And I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard Bible. The scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour, and they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement so that they could deliver him to the rule and the authority of the governor. And they questioned him, saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he detected their trickery and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were unable to catch him in a saying in the presence of the people. And being amazed at his answer, they became silent. Thank you, Adam. It's always interesting when you can't remember where you put the remote. I know I had it somewhere, but who knows where it is. So that's one of those things that happens. Well, good to see everybody here today. It's been a long weekend. Some of you deserve naps today. So you can tell there's a few things that are different, some decorations down the hallway. We seem to have a tomb here, but there's good news. It's empty. <laughs> so I'm not sure there's a need for it yet, but uh, that's the great thing about today is that it is an empty tomb and Jesus has risen and we are able to rejoice in him and all the good things that he has brought to us. So Bible Bowl yesterday, over 100 kids, probably closer to 200 people all together. Um, lots of great things going on. And uh, let me just give you a little bit of a clue. See if we can get some of these. These are just some of the teams that came. Joel was uh, doing a lesson for them. Uh, lots of kids were here singing, able to take a test just being able to show you some of our kids and some of the things that went on a little bit. We had coaches who were helping them, making sure they didn't cheat, I mean. <laughs> we're talking about honesty today. There was lots of honesty going on yesterday as well. Uh, so lots of kids spread out all over the place, just being able to have studied the Bible and come together on the book of John and take a test and... Uh, do some competing with each other. And then also lots of fun things that they were able to do as well. Uh, lots of good activities and things like that that happened. And then on top of that, there were some awards that were won. So congratulations to those of you who got awards. Great job. And uh, great job to all the parents who have been able to be involved in teaching this and in helping this and instructing and just one of the great things that we see here at Mesa. So lots of good things going on yesterday. All right, so today we want to talk about, uh, we're going to continue talking about some of the core things and those fundamentals that make us able to change. In Exodus 20 and verse 16, it's a very short command. He simply says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Seems pretty easy today, right? Because after all, we're not in court. So we don't have to worry about lying today since we're not in court and uh, my neighbor isn't there and uh, we're good. Maybe there's more to this than that, however. When have you ever been in court and had to testify against your neighbor, right? Because they're basically good people. It's just the one on either side, though, right? Those are neighbors. The one across the street, they're different. We don't have to be neighbors to them. They're across the street people, you know. So it's just my neighbor, except for Jesus tends to define neighbor as being bigger than just the guy in the house on the right or the left. He defines neighbor as pretty much anybody, 
And so don't bear false witness. Is that only when you're under oath? Or is that any time when you're telling anything about them or about yourself? You see, it gets bigger as you go. <laughs> so be honest is basically, what if it isn't really lies though? You're not telling lies, you're just, you're telling rumors. Now, rumors could be true. Isn't that the difference between lies and rumors? I mean, lies, we don't lie. We're never supposed to lie. But rumors could be true or could not be true. So if we tell those it's just rumors, well, then sometimes they turn out not to be the case. But, well, I don't think that fits in here either, does it? So we need to not spread rumors, not uh, give away too much here even if they're only true once. No rumors. He says, I want you to do what and say the things that are right. And don't spread any kind of talk about your neighbor or about yourself or about anything that isn't true. The story that was read to us today out of Luke chapter 20, you see the chief priests and the scribes trying to trap Jesus. And I want you to just use this as an illustration for the way these things happen today. I'm sure you've been in this situation before where there's somebody trying to trap you. Dallas may feel trapped like, you know, they're evaluating his teaching. And of course, he's an excellent teacher. It's just not everybody knows that. And so uh, you don't want anybody spreading any rumors or anything, Jack. <laughs> So, <laughs> that's one of those things where we get in these situations where we feel like we're kind of, you know, we hope nobody says anything that's wrong. But Jesus finds himself in that situation a lot. So here they're trying to trap him. They wanted to lay hands on him, which means kill him. Okay, just translating a little bit. Because they thought maybe he's told this parable about us. And the parable he told was the parable of the tenants where the owner gives this land, this vineyard to these people and uh, they don't want to pay. They don't want to give him any of the crop. And so they kill every servant he sends. In fact, he sends his son and they kill his son and say, well, yeah, we're never going to do that. And they think it might be about them. It is. It very much is about them. So when you're telling a story about somebody to their face, well, yeah, this gets awkward, doesn't it? How do you speak the truth? And that's really the situation that's going on here. Some people are just mean. And some people, you got to defend yourself. Jesus did tell a parable about them. He had said some things about them. And the problem is not in saying things, but it's in being honest about what you say. Because he was being honest about what he said. Yes, they're not recognizing who the Son is. Yes, they're not recognizing the Son is sent from God, and they're not really trying to understand what he has to say. So there's a little bit of sneakiness, a little bit of being afraid of people. Because after all, they can't do it in front of others because they wanted to kill him. They wanted to, and so they even send in spies right around him so that, you know, possibly they'll be able to catch him in his words. And they come with this great flattery. Have you ever had someone come with great flattery? It's always good, isn't it, for the first 30 seconds? People come in, we think you're the greatest preacher ever. You go, oh, well, of course, thank you. And it just kind of goes up from there. No, no, as soon as they say that, it's like, you've got to be suspicious. <laughs> you know, you're already giving it away. I already know better than that. Why are you saying this? It's like when your kids start off with, I love you, mom, or I love you, dad. You know the next thing's going to be something that they want. And so this kind of flattery brings suspicion immediately. And so that's what they're doing. They come to Jesus, and they don't want to be discredited at all, but they say, you know, we just, 
you know, want to know you're a man from God. You're the one who always teaches what's right. You're the one who's always doing what God wants in the way God wants it. Yeah, what do you want? <laughs> it's kind of a setup there, isn't it? So their question is, do we, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar? Well, that's a loaded question, and they've carefully phrased it so they can catch him. Because after all, if you say it's not lawful, then he's in trouble with the Roman government. If you say, yes, you do have to pay taxes this year, well, that's not going to win you any elections, right? That's not going to win you any kind of popularity. And so then it's going to be like, well, we shouldn't have said that. And so they think they've got the perfect question. You know, should we pay tribute? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? They don't want to pay taxes to Caesar. Nobody wants to pay taxes to Caesar. He's there. He's someone from outside who's captured them, who's trying to tell them what to do. And Jesus simply says, well, show me the coin. The coin's a denarii. And then he simply says, well, whose inscription says, then give Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give God what belongs to God. Don't you wish you could come up with answers like Jesus does? I mean, I don't know how he gets all of these. He is so good at this. Boy, that is so tremendous. Sure, he says, essentially, yes, you do have to pay taxes this year, so you do have to file those. <clears throat> Whether it's Rome or U.S. or whatever it is, you do have to give to them what they have or what's due to them, but also give honor to God when honor belongs to God, because that's most important. Honor, respect, obedience, allegiance, praise, glory, all of that belongs to God. Now, I don't know that all of that belongs to the government, but all of that belongs to God. And so it's not a battle. It's not a fight. It's not, well, is it one or the other? It's no, you just do both, and it's the one to whom it belongs. Worship belongs to God, not to Caesar. And so we can understand what he's trying to say, and they cannot catch him in front of the people. It's so frustrating when you can't catch somebody and doing something wrong, isn't it? Well, no, we're not trying to do that. Would we ever do that? But they seem to be very intent on doing that. And this is all about, can we be honest with each other? Can we be honest in what we say? Can we be honest in what we present? So here's an example of people who are completely dishonest. I mean, they're asking a question, but the question isn't to get an answer to the question. The question is to be able to trap him. And so the way that they're asking, you just have to understand what it is that's going on. Jesus knows this. He's aware of this. He sees it, he sees it coming. He knows what they're trying to do. And so he's going to answer it the way that, that they're able to get a clear answer. And Jesus can always stand by what he says. Jesus isn't always nice. You know, normally the sermon would go this way, and, you know, we always got to be nice to people. We always got to say good things to people. We've always got to build them up and encourage them and uplift them, and that's all well and true. But there are some times when you need to be honest, and that may not be about what's perfect about them, because not everybody in this world is perfect. And Jesus finds himself faced with some people who are not. Well, what do we do? You go back to the, whatever the bunny's name was. If you can't say something nice, don't say something at all, right? That's not in the Bible. And that's not the tactic of Jesus at all. But he does stand behind every single thing that he says. And that's what we have to realize. That's where we have our trouble today. We tend to want to say things about somebody and then say, oh, well, no, I didn't say that. Yeah, we did. Well, you mistook it. And sometimes that happens. Look at what Jesus says. Some questions can't be answered 
with an honest and truthful answer because the question is not an honest and truthful question. We can find ourselves in trouble with that. They come with another question about a lady who's had seven husbands and they want to figure out, well, whose husband will she be in, he in heaven? And Jesus basically says, bad question. Not giving you an answer to that. The question's bad. And so it isn't that every question has an answer. Jesus just, he calls them names. He pronounces a curse. Look at Matthew chapter 23. This is the worst of it, I guess. And I didn't include all the chapter just because we don't have time. He says, woe to you. And anytime something starts off with woe, that's not a good thing. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like the whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and of all uncleanness. So also outwardly you appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Not exactly pleasant conversation, is it? I mean, Jesus can be very confrontational, and he can say things, is it true? It is absolutely true. And you don't find them coming back saying, no, that's not us. But Jesus knows that before he says any of this, it is absolutely true. So when they start off with, whoa, that's not a good greeting, so Jesus is talking bad about somebody, and he does not back off. You see, we need to be able to talk about sin. We need to be able to say when something is bad and not back off of that. We need to have this kind of honesty about the situation our world is in and, and about the situation where we find ourselves. It is not, however, a personal attack. He does not tell them they're ugly. He does not tell them they're stupid. He talks about their relationship with God. And so he says, you know what? You do not have the relationship with God because what's inside is, is awful. What's inside is so corrupt. What's inside is not what you want to be at all. And then he gives you a couple of examples which... I find hilarious. He talks about dirty dishes. If you ever get invited to someone's house and their kitchen looks like this and they say, grab a plate, <laughs> you know you're in the wrong place. But that's what he says. Here's what you look like. You've this is the way you eat. You, you, you try washing the outside, but you never clean the inside. You ever looked inside that coffee cup? It's only bad if you use cream, right? If you use cream, you have to wash the cup. If you don't use cream, then not so much. But if you use cream, you better wash the cup because it's bad in there. And you don't just lick off your fork. You wash it, right? That's never a good thing. And so it's important. He says... Here's what you look like. You look like the dirty dishes that have never been cleaned. And, and it looks like, well, as long as it's clean on the outside, who cares about what's on the inside? Anybody who's eating does. That's who. And so he calls them like he sees them. You, you, the outside's clean, but the inside is just absolutely disgusting. And then the whitewashed tombs. Each one of those has a very nice little courtyard, a very nice little place, and they've whitewashed all of those, you don't want to look inside. More than that, you don't want to smell inside because that's not a good thing, and it's there to look pretty, and we do this today. You see the places in the mausoleum. You see the places where we would bury them. They have the best grass ever, much better than our lawns, right? Or they have the prettiest little marble place and that's fine but he says just realize 
when he's making a comparison and saying that's what your life is like, you're trying to cover up the death that is in you, that's not a nice thing to say. He calls them blind guides. He is not afraid to say the things that need to be said. He's not starting rumors. He doesn't spread rumors. But when something bad needs to be said, you can say it. And so we need to be able to confront sin as well and be able to deal with those things, but do not mis misrepresent things or lie about things or tell them exaggerated or gossip about somebody. Do not make it personal. If you're trying to talk to them about their sin, talk to them about their sin. But don't make it about how they dress or about how they are as a person there's where you need to encourage and lift up all the time. Say what you need to say. But we also need to own up to our words. We also need to be sure that we don't say negative things and then hoping no one will hear it, right? So I can, you know, talk to somebody about somebody else and then, well, I hope nobody hears that. If you're going to say something and it comes out, you better own up to your words. Jesus does. Say what you mean, mean what you say. But along with that, you don't have to tell everything you know, okay? Sometimes you might want to just leave some things out that you know. Not everything has to be said. And so if you don't want everything said about you, maybe you don't need to say everything about somebody else. It's not a truth-telling contest to say how many right facts can we say about everybody but I think it fits more into this category we need to know what it means to be honest honest is more than not lying honest is truth telling truth speaking truth living and truth loving and so all of those have to fit in. The actions have to back that up. And so why is this core? Well, core has to be a person who tells the truth. And that's who we are. Not that we can't say some things that are unpleasant. Not that we can say some things that but we just don't need to be a liar. We don't need to say something that's not true. And that's whether it's a liar about ourselves, because we usually come out better than ourselves, and that's more the exaggeration, or a liar about others, about what they're not, and make them look worse, or a liar about our situation, or a liar about our circumstance, where we always look good, but everybody else... If you find a person who's always looking good in every story they tell, yeah, be suspicious. The disciple's example is tell the truth. Because after all, if he doesn't tell the truth about himself, and about his own life, how are you going to trust him when he tells you about Jesus? We've got to be there. We've got to be there as people who say what's right, who are honest, and be able to say what Jesus says. If you're honest in the little things, you're going to be honest in the bigger things. And that's just the way it is. We've got to have this kind of honesty. Matthew chapter 21, Jesus tells a story about different people, which kind of plays into all this. He says, what do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first, and he said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son, and he said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? And he said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe in him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your mind and believe him. Wow. Did he just tell him go to hell? I think so. You can say what you need to say. 
And Jesus says, you guys are not getting in. And even the sinful people are able to get in because they heard Jesus, they believed Jesus, they understood Jesus, and they changed their life. And they realized I'm being dishonest if I claim to be a follower of Jesus or a child of God and, and I still live the way that I have. I can't do that. And so as you look at this and look at this story, you have to realize what it's about. It's about belief and accepting Jesus. It's not about which son do you like, because that's always where we go first, right? Yeah, I had that first son. Uh, we all had the second one. Uh, we all had both sons, right? Sometimes they would say, yes, I'll do it, and then, ah, it never got done. They just had too many things in the way. There's something else always happening. And there's all these reasons and excuses why it just cannot get done. And then sometimes we had the other son, the first one. He's going to talk back a little bit. I want you to go work in the vineyard. No. Well, that kind of sets you back. But the father doesn't force him. He doesn't come back with, I told you, I want. And this is more the way God is with us. He will tell us what he wants of us. And then it is up to us to do it. It is up to us to be honest about his response. Yes, I will. No, I won't. Or we don't say anything at all, right? So therefore, we didn't promise anything. Is that right? No, we heard him. And we still have to answer because we did hear him. And then we have to answer about this. So which one did the will of the Father? Well, they know. It's the one who actually went and did the work. It's not about profit or loss in the vineyard. It's not about how much work got done. It's, it's really about whether you believe the Father when he said, I want you to do this. And the first son believed the Father. I understand you want me to, and my answer is no. And the second son is, well, I understand you want me to, and I'll work it in if I can. And he never quite did that. See, there's no obedience till you first believe. And that's what his whole conclusion is because he ends with this. Tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And when they believed him, then you're going to act on what you know, right? Because when I believe something, then I'm going to do something as a result of that. And so he draws this in to be able to say that. We'll never do something if we don't believe it in the first place. There's no obedience till you first believe it. It's not just trying to get grapes picked in a vineyard. It's about, I want you to do the will of the Father, whatever that will is. It's not about a certain amount of work's got to get done. We've got quotas. Church is really not about quotas. It's about the amazing things that happen when people believe in God and God is able to work through them in an incredible way. And that's what we see happening. The Father calls me to himself and then he sends me out. And when I'm honest with God about myself and honest with God and other people about them and about who I am in this world, it changes everything about this. Well, what if we're on the other side? What if people are the ones talking about us? What if people are the ones mistreating us? What if, you know, they started rumors and, you know, they didn't know if the rumors were true or not, and uh, rumors are not true. But they're saying all this stuff about us. Well, what do we do? Do we fight, argue, go get them? They're supposed to come and tell us, right? Yes. They're supposed to come to us first. If they have a problem with us, they should come to us. And then we'll work it out, whatever the issue is. But that wasn't even what they wanted to do. I just wanted to say some things and talk about things and really had no intention of working anything out with us. It's just we enjoy rumors sometimes. No, there are not any going on that I know of. 
So this sermon is not directed at anything lest you think it is. But what happens if people do say something about you? Well, I think maybe the best thing to do is realize what happened with Jesus. It is never going to be fair. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. Peter learned this after a long time. Peter was the guy who's ready to take a sword. You can't arrest my Lord. I'll take down all of you. He's got a whole Roman cohort there, and he gets the slave of the high priest, and all he gets is an ear, and yeah. What if people come and mistreat us and take Jesus and arrest Jesus? And Peter had to learn this lesson. I cannot demand fairness in my whole life. He says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honor Christ as Lord, as Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with all gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Tough passage, isn't it? I'd rather not have to suffer at all. That would be my choice. Let's don't suffer at all. If you've lived very long, you know that's never the case because you're going to. It's not a matter of whether or not you will. It's you decide by the honesty in your life whether it's going to be for things that are right or whether it's going to be for things that are wrong. Whether it's going to be for things that are right that you stood for and that you said and that you said, I believe in this. Or whether it's going to be for things that are wrong that you got caught in that you hope no one would find out. And Peter says, I think we can look at his life and say he's been on both sides of this. He says, it's better when I'm honest with myself, when I'm honest with my God, when I'm honest with every single person around. And I'd rather suffer for doing what's right for Jesus Christ than for anything because that's where I'll make my stand. That's where I'll place my respect. He says, do it with gentleness and respect. Keep a good conscience, and don't forget where you come from. We come from Jesus Christ, because Christ suffered once for sins in trying to bring us to God. He said he would. He said it. He meant it, he determined to do it, and he suffered as someone who was unjust, even though he didn't do any wrong. And that will happen to you. You're in good company. But you stand for what you stand for. And so maybe the question now is, are you honest with God? Can you say, yes, I am that honest person. I'm, whatever I said, I'll apologize for. I'll say I shouldn't have said it. I'll say, yes, I still believe that, whatever it is. But I will stand for what I will stand for. And so what's your relationship like with God? Are you hoping he doesn't find out things? Or is it just, you know, I need to repent of some things, and then it'll be okay? And I can stand for what I say I will. Commitment means staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you set it in has left you. I don't know if you've ever been caught in a situation like this. Boy, that gets tough, doesn't it? So what do you say about God Jesus comes so that we might repent of our sins and believe in him and that he might die on a cross for us and wash away our sins in baptism 
and we give our life to him and we make a promise to him and we make a covenant with him and then we live our life based on that statement. Here's where we live. Here's who we are. And that is honest. When people like it or don't like it, we're going to stand right there. Maybe today you're ready to be honest about your life and about where you stand with God. Boy, if we can help with that. If you need to be baptized into Christ, if you need to make that covenant with Him, come while we stand.